Fellowship Live, Church of the Living Word. The, the Living, Living Word, Word with Pastor, Pastor Terry Kern. Greetings, my name is Pastor John Hansen, and I welcome you to this broadcast of The Living Word with Pastor Terry Kern, a ministry of Truth Fellowship Live. Truth Fellowship Live is a new church in the Bismarck community located at 1020 South 12th Street, just south of Cashwise Foods. Truth Fellowship Live conducts ministries directed toward evangelizing the lost, training those who trust in Christ to do the work of the ministry, and developing Christ-centered leaders in the community. Our fellowship emphasizes the careful and straightforward teaching of the Bible as the true and inherent Word of God. Truth Fellowship Live maintains a free grace outlook, which means we strongly hold to the doctrine that salvation is by faith alone. To that end, we believe in the importance of studying and obeying the Word of God. People today believe many things regarding what it means to be a Christian, but the Bible is very clear that the only way to eternal life is by trusting in Christ alone for salvation. The Bible says that all people are separated from God through disobedience. The Bible terms this sin. We are all guilty before God because of sin, and we are condemned to eternal death. But the Bible also says that Jesus Christ died for those sins. Christ has paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. By trusting in Him alone, we receive eternal life. Please join me as we study the Word of God together with Pastor Terry. Verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we um, dedicate now this, this time to this passage, Lord, let it sink in deep in our hearts. Let our hearts be ready and our ears be wakened um, to hear this message, Lord. It is so important, not only for us to have a, a clearer understanding of how this whole Bible thing intertwines together and what Jesus has promised us, and with that full understanding that we have so many others out there that do not have that blessed hope. That this can be a passage that does strike interest in people. It fascinates those, even non-believers, um, that we can use this knowledge and, and to know time is short. Mm. Whether it be our own uh, natural deaths or the rapture, the, the clock is ticking and we are getting absolutely to the end. We do not have time now to sit back and, and just uh, in a comfortable state. There are so many others out there that need to know you and your message that you died and rose again. For if you care at all, people of the church, of, of, of those people that are non-believers that you once want to, to see forever, Give them the message, the message in this Bible, the message of chapter 4 and 1 Thessalonians. This is so important, Lord, and we, we just want this, the Holy Spirit to guide us now, that this is a passage that we do not daydream through, that we do not wander off, that we are totally engaged in what Pastor Terry has to say. Lord, we pray this as a church. Amen. <clears throat> Guy is something else, isn't he? 
with all that was going on in your life this week, how in the world did you have time to do that? That's what I want to know. No, I, I, I think I agree with that. <laughs> oh, welcome to all of you who are joining us online and via television. We are uh, at the, uh, the, the last point on the sermon outline sheet uh, called uh, verse 18 of First Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, this, is, uh, this is our way of uh, handling this verse, which is, Therefore comfort one another with these words, because the things that we're going to be talking about today uh, are extremely comforting. Uh, confidence giving, joy bringing, uh, inspiring, uh, and challenging as well, in, uh, as uh, Chris has been uh, reminding us of how important it is that people need to hear this. Anyway, so that's, uh, you should have a sermon outline sheet that, that looks fairly normal, and then you should have another sheet uh, available to you, those of you who are here, uh, a hard copy, uh, as um, with a, a, a single chart on one side and four charts on the other side, uh, and I believe that is going to be made available as well to all of you who are joining us online and uh, via television. All right, uh, you know, I have so much I'd love to say about all of this stuff, and uh, there's only, you know, like this much I'm going to be able to say because of time, but uh, there is so much here in this whole arena uh, subject of biblical teaching that uh, I'm just going to have to go for it and see what I can get done. All right, uh, even people who are completely secular... Uh, who have uh, no uh, spiritual interest or biblical knowledge or awareness at all, uh, even those people agree with the fact that uh, we all seem to be noticing the unusual nature of our times that we're living in. Uh, you don't have to be very old <laughs> to realize that this is, this is something new. Uh, the chaos and the volatility of, of culture, not just here in the United States, but around the world, uh, is, is uh, it seems like people are behaving crazier and crazier, more volatile every day. And uh, um, what you thought would never, ever be happening yesterday is what people are doing as a normal part of their life today, and it's, it's just crazy. Um, Pastor David Jeremiah gave a sermon series a number of years ago, and he titled it that, uh, Things I Thought I'd Never See in My Lifetime, and he gave a sermon series. That inspired uh, a, J a lady by the name of Jan Martell, uh, who, is that, did I say that right? Markell. Markell. Um, to, um, to write an article. Uh, Jan is the, uh, the founder and the president, has been for many years, of this uh, Messianic Jewish organization uh, out of the Twin City area um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul area uh, called Olive Tree Ministries. Well, Jan uh, kind of picked up on Pastor Jeremiah's idea and she wrote an article by that name and then a second part of that article by that name. Uh, and uh, she did, she's, I, I think it was like a year ago that she started writing this. But things have been happening so fast uh, in her that, that she never thought she would see in her entire lifetime that she has actually updated uh, that article with version 2 and, uh, and uh, Pat, Dr. Dave just tells me uh, version 3 of that. Uh, so last week I read this, uh, this last article and... Uh, uh, her last point on this last article uh, of things that she never thought she'd ever see in her lifetime was this. I'm going to quote now. Only one church in my hometown of Minneapolis, and then she does this, land of 10,000 churches. <laughs> Only one church in my hometown of Minneapolis would preach on the rapture. 
only one church. Um, she never thought she would ever live to see the day that the rapture of the church would be a subject no pastor would want to preach on. The whole city of Minneapolis, which is a huge city, and there are lots of churches in Minneapolis, she found one. Folks, <laughs> I tell you, that is shocking. That is a shocking idea. And, and uh, you know, if we're not shocked by that, it's probably because we've become, we've become kind of jaded about, about things that are taking place. But every pastor of every church, every church leader, every Christian in every church ought to be, ought to be strong and supportive and standing in uh, the idea that, uh, that the teaching of the truth of the Scriptures, especially... Uh, about the rapture of the church and the things that are going to take place at the end of this age, those truths concerning the second coming of Christ to the earth must be being taught. But they're not. Uh, if a church, a, a pastor, a Christian has any commitment to the Word of God at all, uh, to teaching the whole counsel of God, one of the things we ought to be uh, strongly demanding is that uh, every church be teaching what God has plainly told us he wants us to do in light of the end of the age. Uh, and especially this whole section of God's word, it's more than a fourth, it's almost a third of the Bible that was prophecy when the Bible was written. Now, not all of those relate to the second coming of Christ, that's for sure, and some of them have already been fulfilled, a, a, num a number of them. But there is still a great deal of prophetic truth in the Scriptures that is yet to take place. Whole books of the Bible, like the book of Revelation, uh, and much of First and Second Thessalonians, as we've been studying, uh, are things that are yet to take place. So, folks, we are living in the last days of the last days on earth as we know it. Uh, I doubt very many Christians uh, live with that kind of sense that we are actually living in these last days. Um, the nation of Israel is celebrating this year its 70th birthday as a nation. That one fact alone, folks, that one simple fact alone uh, is basis for every Bible-believing person to be demanding that the church that they attend be teaching the prophecies of the Scripture regarding the second coming of Christ. That one fact alone. Uh, the church is the bride of Christ, and the bride of Christ must be called to readiness. Uh, the, the bride of Christ must be called to be sober, to be vigilant, to be watching, to be alert for the coming of her bridegroom to get her and to take her back to heaven. So this is part three. <laughs> Chris, you didn't even mention that today. This is the third time we've read this short little passage. You had a lot of other stuff that you had to say. Part three of Truth Fellowship Live's uh, sermon or preaching and teaching on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is one uh, of three central passages in the Bible, the New Testament, about the rapture. There are three central passages. There are many, many more, but uh, passages that talk about the rapture, and, and, uh, and I, I will talk about one of, one of those other ones, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, but it is often not considered a central passage, but that's because it's mis misunderstood. But anyway, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But the three pretty re recognized by everyone central passages on the rapture of the church are John chapter 14, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then this passage that we're studying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Today, uh, we want to kind of take a little step back and look at the, at the teaching about the rapture as a whole about the catching away of the church. Um, I told you last Sunday at the end of the message uh, that I would survey the various views of the rapture. I, I'm, I'm not really going to do a very good survey. I, I realize uh, that it's not going to be a, a, a proper teaching a, approach to all giving all attention to all four views because I don't believe the other views. Um, I'll certainly try to summarize them 
But let's get started with, uh, with, that, uh, with that sheet uh, in your bulletin or that will be posted up for you to see uh, that looks like this. Um, that is a, a chronology of eschatology. Uh, chronology, you, I probably don't need to explain that. Eschatology is the study of the biblical teaching on the last thing, the things that occur at the very end of time. Uh, as we know it. So that chronology, that chart is, um, is taken from one of the most helpful books uh, that's ever been written on Bible prophecy. A, a, a Messianic Jewish guy who is as cute as he can be, but an incredible scholar. Uh, his name is Arnold Fruchtenbaum. You think that's Jewish? Uh, I think it is. He's a, he's a Messianic Jew uh, and he's a great scholar, and he has written this book called Footsteps of the Messiah. And this chart is, uh, is lifted from that wonderful book. Note on the left-hand side of that chart, there's a cross. And, of course, uh, that represents our Lord's death on the cross, uh, where he provided eternal salvation for everyone who believes in him. Uh, and, of course... Uh, on the third day after he died and was buried uh, in the tomb, he arose from the grave. Forty days after he arose, after he had spent some time teaching his disciples, uh, he ascended back into heaven. Uh, his disciples asked him, as he was about to ascend back into heaven, are you going to set up your kingdom now? Uh, and he told them, uh, essentially, no, not now, uh, but it's not. It's not that it's not going to come. It's just not going to come now is essentially what he told them. Ten days after uh, they watched him ascend into heaven, uh, the disciples experienced an incredible, incredible day there in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, we have come, it was the, the day of Pentecost in Jewish uh, celebration life, but it's also the day that the church began, the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ. It's very, very clear that on that day the Holy Spirit came in a new way and God began something new uh, in his way of uh, relating to the world. On the chart there, you see it uh, as a little arc underneath, to the right of the cross, underneath the, uh, the larger arc that says dispensation of grace is the smaller arc called the church age. That's the time the period of time in history that we are in right now. Uh, in a little over 14 years, folks, we will have been in this church age for 2,000 years. In a little over 14 years, we will have been in this church age for 2,000 years. What you should know is that this age is nearly over. No age in all of human biblical history has been any longer than this age of time. In fact, there's been none that has actually uh, been quite this long. Uh, I, am, I am confident, uh, with a high degree of confidence actually, that we are at the very end of this age, and that God is about to go through, we're going to, about to go through some very major changes in God's program and plan for the world. Now, when I say I'm confident, I know that there are some people who just are grated by a statement like that. <laughs> Nobody can be that confident. You, you should, you're arrogant. Uh, and I, folks, I'm not confident in me. Believe me, every day that I get up, I have less confidence in me, in this. Uh, and you would too if you lived in this. So <laughs> it, it, has, it has nothing to do with me. It's no confidence in me at all. It's confidence in Him and in His Word. And every day that I read His Word, uh, I have less confidence in me and more confidence in Him and what He is about to do. Uh, his Word is clear. Uh, and when you rightly handle it, when you give it the reverence and interpret it, what it for what it says, uh, it is it is just astounding 
how much confidence and joy and, and uh, assurance and comfort and, and all of those wonderful things it gives you. And I'm, I'm actually very confident that we are at the very end of this age of grace. I don't, I don't have any idea how many more years or maybe even decades there are left in this age, but I know, I, I feel like I know, uh, that we are almost at the end of this age. The Bible clearly teaches that when this age is done, when this church age is done, uh, there will be on the earth seven years of tribulation. Uh, you see that on the, uh, on the, on the chart there. Uh, just to the right of the church age, you see the little arc called the tribulation. That's seven years. The book of Revelation teaches us about that uh, in great detail, and uh, it is an incredible period of time. Human history, all of human history, all of the tribulation <laughs> that the world has known uh, put together in all of human history will not be like these seven years of tribulation on the earth. It is, uh, it is going to be a, a, a horrific time. And what it is, what the tribulation period is, is the wrath of God being poured out upon a sinful world. The wrath of God being poured out on a sinful world. Other things, Satan is going to have a heyday as well. Uh, but, uh, but there are three series of judgments that God pours out on the world during the tribulation period that are uh, absolutely unheard of in all of human history. At the end of the tribulation period, after seven years, and it is very specific to the day, seven years, and that's repeated over and over and over in the, um, in the book of Revelation, from the day that the nation of Israel uh, makes a covenant with this person who will be known as the Antichrist, and the tribulation begins, it'll be seven years to the day that it ends. Uh, the Bible makes that absolutely clear. So, uh, at the end, after the uh, tribulation period, Jesus Christ will return to the earth, uh, and he will set up his messianic kingdom. That's that next arc to the right you see there, the messianic kingdom. It is 1,000 years, uh, six times <laughs> in the book of Revelation chapter 20, uh, we are told by God that this period of time will be 1,000 years long. So seven years and 1,000 years that follow it, uh, and uh, that's the um, millennial kingdom. At the end of the millennial kingdom, all of the unbelieving dead of all of the ages of all of human history will be raised back to life. They will be given resurrection bodies, and they will all, this is all of the unbelievers of every age of all of human history be raised back to life, and they will, along with Satan, uh, all of the fallen angels and so on, cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. Then all believers of all of the ages of human history will enter into uh, what is called the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Arnold Fruchtenbaum calls it the eternal order. That's, the, uh, that's that arrow off to the right of this, uh, of this chart. So that's how the Bible clearly teaches human history will play out. There are lots and lots of details given to us in the Scriptures. Uh, and I know that some of you listening to me right now are finding what I'm saying preposterous. Preposterous. Uh, you might even be scoffing, and you might be saying in your own mind, this goof guy, he's making all this stuff up. This is just made up stuff. You might think I'm talking gibberish. You might dismiss everything I'm saying as religious myth, as a bunch of craziness. Uh, and if you think that, I think there are probably one of two reasons why you'd think that. One of them would be that you just don't believe in God or the Bible or Jesus or any of that. You've rejected all of that. Um, 
I doubt there are very many people listening to me <laughs> because I'm sure they wouldn't be this far into listening to me talk if they, if they probably believe that. But if there are any of you who think that, I just want to encourage you. Uh, God must be working in your heart and life if you're this far into listening to me talk about the Bible. And that must mean that God has something very significant in store for you. And if you would just pursue it and give, uh, give the Bible and God and the Lord Jesus Christ an opportunity to work in your heart and life, uh, you will find the truth and the truth will set you free. And uh, you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life. That's one, that's one possibility. The other possibility is you might believe the Bible or you might uh, believe in Christ, but you have been taught for so long by whatever church it is that you've been going to uh, that, uh, that people who say these things that I'm saying are just taking the Bible way too literally. It doesn't mean that what you're saying it means. Um, the things I'm describing, uh, they're not actual real things that are going to actually really take place. Uh, what you have to do is recognize that that God is telling you all of this in, in kind of symbolic language and fanciful, and, and, and you, have to, you have to just take it uh, differently um, than how I'm, uh, how I'm describing it. Uh, and you probably believe that uh, you can't take anything Bible prophecy related uh, actually as uh, it writes, as it is written for us in the Bible. And if that's the case, you've been taught that uh, because the Roman Catholic Church began about 400 years after the last apostle, the apostle John, died. They began teaching uh, this thing called allegorical interpretation of the Bible, that, that nothing in the Bible, especially Bible prophecy, should be taken liber literally. It doesn't mean what it says. It means something different behind what it says, and you, it's up to you to figure out what it means. So that became kind of the, the way everybody in the whole world uh, began to believe the Bible should be understood and even though many wonderful changes came at the Reformation time around 1500 A.D. in Europe, the Protestant Reformation was what we often call it, allegorical interpretation of the Bible is not one of those things that changed. What did change, however, is that after the Reformation, people began to have the Bible in their own language. And common people didn't have to be Bible scholars. They didn't have to be priests in the church or, or whatever. Uh, people began having the Bible available to them to read. And they began to read it. And they began to take it for what it said, for what it does say. And they began to realize that God has clearly spoken. God has described in detail the things that he does intend to do uh, in the world and that he has promised and prophesied about how it's all going to take place. So, when you read the Bible for what it says, what I described for you in this chart is what God plainly says he is going to do. But not only did these people realize that God has plainly told us, both Old and New Testament, that there is going to be this 1,000-year kingdom on the earth when Jesus Christ returns and sets it up, and he's himself going to rule the earth for 1,000 years. Uh, they also discovered that before that happens, before that kingdom rule of Christ on the earth, there is going to be this seven-year terrible tribulation period on earth too. Now that... Uh, that's described in, in great detail, as I said, in the book of Revelation. So, as people kept reading the Bible and just taking it for what it says, they began to understand that God also described something else in detail of how the church age will end. And that brings us to our other set of charts that look like this. 
because the Bible describes this rapture of the church that's going to take place, this catching away of church-age believers. Now, I don't want to revisit everything that we've studied about the rapture. This is the third sermon on these few short verses in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, today I want to focus on the four. There are actually five views, but uh, I'll explain that in just a minute. Uh, about the when that catching away of the church age believers will happen. Uh, what happens is everybody who is alive at the end of the church age will be re resurrected, get a resurrected body. Just before that, though, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 teaches us that all of the church age believers, everybody who has died during this age from the day of Pentecost forward that I just described, to whatever day that is that the rapture happens, whoever has died will be resurrected. Their body will be resurrected. They will receive a resurrection body. They themselves will be coming back with the Lord from heaven, uh, and he will reunite them with their resurrected body. Then we who are alive uh, at that time will get a, uh, a resurrection body, and it all takes place instantaneously, uh, at least as fast as it takes to blink your eye. And uh, then we will all be caught up together uh, and meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds of the heavens. And that's what's described for us in First Thess 4, uh, John chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 15, and so on. Now there are four views uh, of when the rapture occurs in relationship to the seven years of tribulation that is described. So that's what these four charts are depicting for you. The first one shows what is called a pre-tribulational rapture. That is uh, the rapture view that the resurrection of church age believers and being caught up together to be with Christ occurs sometime before the seven year tribulation begins. We don't know how long, uh, might be very, very short uh, in time distance between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. There, there might be some, some uh, time frame we just don't know. So that's the, the pre-tribulational rapture. The, the one just below that on the sheet is called the post-tribulational rapture. Uh, that teaches that Christians will go through the seven-year tribulation. The, the rapture, uh, resurrection, all of that won't happen until after the tribulation is over. Uh, and then at that time, Jesus will catch all of these people away, take them to heaven, uh, and they go up into the clouds, but then he won't take them back to heaven. He will immediately come back with them to the earth. The third chart, the, the top right-hand side of your, your set of charts, is called the mid-tribulational rapture view, and that, of course, depicts the rapture happening sometime uh, in the middle of the tribulation, actually, in this case, exactly in the middle of the tribulation, but a variation of that mid-trib rapture view is what is called, and this is a most recent one, the pre-wrath rapture view, which teaches that the, ha the rapture will happen shortly after the middle of the tribulation when things start getting really, really, really bad. That's why it's called pre-wrath rapture, as if the tribulation all through the seven years isn't really, really, really bad. Uh, I just like to say some of the things that will happen in the early uh, early part of the tribulation worldwide will make what's taking place in California, those horrific infernos that are taking place in California look like, I don't know, burning your finger with a match? I, I don't know. But uh, what takes place during those first three uh, and a half years of the tribulation period is is horrific, uh, and it only intensifies and gets worse during the last three and a half years, and that will all occur worldwide and so on. So uh, there is really no basis at all for a pre-wrath view. Uh, the fourth view is called a partial rapture view. Uh, that teaches that Christians are raptured at various times throughout the second half of the tribulation, uh, and the rapture happens, according to the partial rapture view, uh, for people who uh, have, have been living really good lives, who don't waver in their faith, 
and uh, when they reach a certain point of spirituality, they are raptured. Uh, and since some people don't do as well as others, they are all raptured at different times. The only problem with that view uh, is that the passages that teach us about the rapture clearly teach that all Christians are raptured exactly at the same time. Uh, and uh, those who are dead in Christ are raised first, then without any gap in time, those who are living are changed instantaneously. All church age believers are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So there's absolutely no passage, no, no basis for the partial rapture view uh, in the scriptures. And we shouldn't waste time talking about views like that because they're false teaching. It's false teaching. Uh, and there's no biblical basis for the mid-trib mid rapture view either. Uh, the ideas to support the mid-trib are simple variations of the pre- or the post-trib views, so I'm not going to spend any more time on that one either. <laughs> I told you I was going to hurry through this. The post-trib rapture view is the view that teaches that the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church are one event, not separated by seven years, but one event that occurs at one time. Uh, all believers uh, are raptured. Uh, they meet the Lord in the clouds of the air, and then he turns around once they are there with him and brings them back to church, to the earth, and the, the church age, every, everything is done, kingdom age follows. Of course, this means that all believers are on the earth throughout the seven years of tribulation. And post-tribbers say that the presence of saints on the earth during the uh, book in the book of Revelation proves that Christians go through the tribulation. Now, folks, it's very, very difficult for me to objectively present the post-trib view because I'm totally convinced that there's absolutely zero basis for it uh, in the scripture, that the rapture of the church will occur before the tribulation begins. Uh, I'm fully convinced of that, as Romans 14, 5 says we all ought to be, fully convinced in our own mind of what the Scripture teaches. So I'm regarding um, the Bible, uh, the rapture of the church teaching of the Bible as that. But So for the next few minutes, rather than try to refute or argue against the post-trib position, I'm simply just going to state some of the major reasons, and this is some of the major reasons. This is not by any means all of them, uh, but I'm just going to survey real quickly, uh, I think I've got four here, uh, major reasons why I believe in a pre-trib rapture of the church. First is uh, the bridegroom comes to get his bride. The bridegroom is Christ, comes to get his bride, the church, and takes her back to heaven to be with him for the wedding celebration. That's what, John, that's what Jesus taught in John chapter 14. He clearly sets the picture of the Jewish wedding ceremony in context with the rapture of his church. He says, in my father's house are many mansions, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I come again, I'm going to take you to be with me to myself. Uh, and, and he clearly presents the idea. When you put that uh, idea, uh, that's what happens with the Jewish wedding celebration where the bridegroom comes and fetches his bride, and after he has made all the things ready in his father's house, uh, he's made everything ready, that he comes suddenly, fetches his bride. She doesn't even know the day that, or the hour that he's coming. He comes, he gets her, he takes her back to the place in his father's house that he's prepared for her, and the great wedding celebration occurs. Uh, when you put that together with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the passage we've been studying, the rapture of the church is clearly prior to the tribulation on the earth. Number two, as you can see, I'm not developing these ideas there. I'm just giving you sketchy idea, overall concepts. But uh, the more you study them, the more solid and uh, foundational they are, the more you realize uh, as you study these passages. Second is the people who populate the, the millennial kingdom age are people who live in their still unresurrected bodies. And uh, those are people who have survived the seven-year 
tribulation period. But if the rapture and the resurrection of all believers occurs at the end of the tribulation period, there's no one left in an unresurrected body uh, to become the, the people who populate the millennial kingdom. Well, post-tribulationists say, well, it's the 144,000, of course. It's the 144,000 who aren't raptured. Uh, but that can't be the case. It cannot be that 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 cannot be the answer. Since Revelation chapter 7 teaches very, very clearly, and if you want to read this, or read it sometime, all 144,000 of those people are Jews. And that would mean that there are no Gentiles uh, in the millennial kingdom to populate it. And that is not the case. There are clearly Gentiles uh, in the millennial kingdom. So post-tribbers uh, and amillennialists are forced to allegorize Revelation chapter 7. They have to say that though it says there are 12,000 from each of the named 12 tribes of the nation of Israel uh, for, to make up the 144,000 Jews, they are forced to say that though it says 144,000 Jews, that's not what it really means. And that's allegorizing the scriptures. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how all of these aberrant views develop. You allegorize a passage because it doesn't fit with what you want it to say. All right, number three. I'm really moving quick here. Second, Corinthians, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter, three, chapter 2, verse 3. Explicitly, folks, explicitly says that the departure... It's translated falling away, but it should say departure. That, that means the rapture is going to play, take place before the tribulation period begins. Paul calls in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this period of time, the tribulation period, the day of the Lord. And uh, he uses the word apostasia to change, uh, uh, and that, that word is changed to mean spiritual falling away rather than physical departure. And lo and behold, it was changed by the Roman Catholic Church in the Rhymes edition uh, of the Catholic Bible and by the New King James translators. Uh, and both of them did it for the wrong reasons. They changed the meaning of the word apostasia from a physical departure, which would mean the rapture, to spiritual apostasy or spiritual falling away. Uh, there are a huge number of reasons why you should understand when you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that it's the rapture that he's talking about, not a spiritual falling away, uh, that that's the proper understanding. And we'll cover those in detail when we get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Number four. The entire New Testament teaches the imminency of the end of the age and the return of Christ. The word imminence means at any moment. Now, I know people have changed the meaning of it to mean suddenness. It doesn't mean that. It means at any moment. And imminence is the very fabric, folks, of the Jewish wedding celebration as well as the second coming of Christ, like a thief in the night, you have to always be ready because it could happen at any moment. There is absolutely nothing that needs to take place before it happens, and it could happen at any moment. If the rapture of the church were to occur at the end of the tribulation, people would literally be able to count the days until it would happen. It completely, uh, the, the, the idea of a post-tribulation rapture completely destroys the concept of imminency. Well, if you don't know the exact day uh, when the, when the uh, tribulation began, maybe you wouldn't know the exact date. At least you would know so many, many, many things that would have to transpire before the end could come. The whole concept of a post-tribulation rapture negates a huge amount of teaching in the New Testament about the imminency of the second coming of the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. It could occur at any moment. The Apostle Paul believed that. 
Bible-believing Christians in every age who read the New Testament naturally believe that the rapture could happen at any moment. The New Testament consistently teaches that the rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's my take on it. Now, there are so many more things I could say. I, I'd love to talk about the passages that say that we're not, we're, that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come, that, we're, that Christians are not going to go through the wrath of the tribulation period. There's, there's a great deal there. There's a, there's a whole bunch of teaching. Um, there's a bunch of other things that we could say that support the concept of a pre-tribulational rapture. But if you have any questions, please, please ask them. You can go to truthfellowshiplive.com, and I know you can ask questions there, or you can call Pastor John, and he will answer all of your questions. His number is 701-390-7311. Right? 701-390-7311. Write it down. You can call him and he will be delighted to respond to any of your questions. And I'm telling the truth on that. He is, he's a wonderful guy. He does that. Okay, here's the timeless truth that I wrote and I'll be done. I know it's been long. Sorry, folks. But I didn't get on till a little later today. I, I want you to know there are reasons why I why I was a little late getting on, and they aren't all my fault. That it was late. Uh, believe me, even though I'm the last one and gets blamed for being late, it's not always all my fault. <laughs> all right, here's the timeless truth: God has spoken. Jesus the Christ is going to come again. He's going to fetch his bride, gather his saints, rapture his church. And that day is, folks, very near. Nothing, absolutely nothing has to happen, has to take place before that blessed hope occurs. It can truly take place at any moment. Are you ready? That is the question. All right, the living lesson is exactly the same living lesson of last week. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us this wonderful teaching about the rapture of your church. Thank you for the promise that we will be reunited with our loved ones who have died in Christ. Thank you for the promise that we will be with, that we will be with you forever. And if you have not yet believed in Jesus, my friend, do so right now. Do not wait another second. The rapture could truly occur at any moment. Lord, thank you so much for these uh, wonderful truths that give us hope, that give us joy, give us comfort, and that give us confidence. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray these days. Well, thanks, Pastor Terry, for opening up the Word of God to us, and thank you for joining us. Did you know you can be certain you have eternal life beyond a shadow of a doubt? The Bible says this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. If you'd like to learn more about your life in Christ, please contact me, Pastor John, or one of our staff, at truthfellowshiplive.com or call us at 701-751-0103. I'd also like to invite you to consider joining us in worship on Sunday mornings. Fellowship time begins at 10 a.m., followed by our worship service at 10.30. Our address again is 1020 South 12th Street, Bismarck. Thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful week.